Now what I want to do is show you real quick a video I promised before uh, that will f uh, kind of talk about perceptual adaptation. That's glasses that are worn um, that are t to show the world upside down. Was there a question? Oh, sure, yeah, a seminar on Friday. Um, yeah, thanks for asking. I'm, th there's a little um, talk that my wife and I are giving at a church here on Friday on uh, relationships, communication, conflict, and gender differences. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we just, in fact, Elisa and I, we travel around talking at different universities. We just got back from Multnomah University just this weekend up there. Anybody from that area? Oregon? Yeah, way to go. It was beautiful. And uh, we'll be at Abilene Christian coming up. But anyway, we travel around to different colleges and universities talking about relationships, uh, dating, uh, engaged, married. Um, and this particular one will be Friday night at a local church here called Whittier Hills Baptist where we attend. And it's Friday night at 7, and so any, everybody's, well, anybody's welcome if you want to go. And it's on gender differences, and then communication and conflict within relationships. A couple of hours long, um, but like I said, Elisa and I will both be talking. If anybody's interested, anybody interested, maybe, kind of? It's, it's they'll, they'll even give you a bus up there if you want. It's only about, I don't know how far away it is from here, maybe four miles? Anyway, if you're interested, I know that if you, uh, thanks for asking, that if you wanted to go, I think it's free. If, oh, you could register online, or if you go, it might cost a little bit more, because I know they want to do food. And I know all of this because um, it, there's even someone here that will take your registration. Now, they, th they were here on campus, and they're here today in class. Did you have a question? Yeah. What time of day again? Seven on, this Friday night at seven, and I think it goes seven until... I get tired of talking, which would be like midnight. <laughs> I think it's like 7 to 9 or 10 or something like that. If you're interested, I do know this. The person that's here that would know all the answers is in the back, and there, they'll be in the foyer, is that what we call that thing back there, right after class. So there'll be somebody back there if you're interested in, in, in getting more information or signing up. Thanks for asking. Are you going? Oh, cool. Anybody know? Ooh, we'll talk. Yeah, there's some. I'll save some of these gender differences things and relationship things for then. But I'll get. By, by the way, we'll talk about what are the uh, like. For example, if you see these four things show up in a relationship or a marriage, you can use these four thing. Four. Does this keep cutting out? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know really how to fix it to be honest. Um, but anyway, you, if you find these four things uh, in a relationship. What ends up happening is they almost always uh, are signs of a relationship in trouble, including a marriage. Including a marriage. And when, yeah. so we'll, I'll just keep yelling. And, um, and when you see these four things in a, in a relationship, we'll, we'll talk about those and what they are. What, what, what is one, of all of those four things that might show up in a relationship, which one is the greatest likelihood of leading to divorce? Anybody know what those... Anybody know what those four things are that would show up? We'll, um, we'll talk about them <laughs> when I get a good microphone. Question, yeah? And, 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 and that's kind of some examples. And by the way, I'll share that with you in this class at one point if you want, just not right now. Uh, do you have any uh, of your seminars online? Some of the seminars, yeah, he asked if they're online. Um, as of now, none of these are online at this point. It doesn't mean that they won't be. This one we might film and put online. I don't know. We'll see. But, yeah. Yeah, like CDs or something. Yeah, or CDs or something like that. Yeah, possibly. We, um, we, 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 yeah, hopefully we'll even maybe get into a chapel soon and do it again. Uh, but we'll look at the possibility of putting some of this material more online for people. If you can't, obviously, if you can't make it on Friday because you got plans. I, I, I honestly don't know what would be more important, but you might have other plans, and so I, but, but, but we will be praying for you. All right. Um, 
No, if you've been if you've been selected for the IQ thing and they told you and you have an email and all of that, you're fine. It just, sometimes they're going to do it later. You might come in the later part of the semester. Don't worry about it. Yep, you're welcome. All right, let's see if I can get this video working. This is a person who was wearing the upside down glasses. We'll just see if this works. Oh, wait. It's just a cool demonstration of uh, the adaptability of our perceptual abilities and how they can grow to adjust to an artificial world. Yes. A London art student who has agreed to undertake a curious experiment. No, no, excuse me. If I could have a look at these most unusual spectacles on you. For one whole week, she will see the world upside down. Inverting once again what the lens and the eye does anyway. Our brains correct for this inversion. Now hers will be forced to make yet another correction. Will she be able to make sense of an upside down world? I'm sure I'm holding the cup. Hey Kathy, it's me. We'll be do we'll be calling you in a few minutes. Is that good? Okay, sounds good. Probably within about um, I don't know, maybe about 15 minutes. Okay, bye. Susanna's final day, she tries to draw. With a week's practice, she can now sign her name to the drawing right side up while looking. Hey, Joe, my microphone is cutting very in and out a lot. Is there anything I'm doing wrong? And it shows that it's green, but yeah, anything you can do would be helpful. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Okay, what's interesting about this, of course, is um, what we call the plasticity of her brain, and that's part of what we, this notion of perceptual adaptation, this plasticity simply means that her perceptual systems um, can adjust and alter to something even as radical as that, and it doesn't take um, that long for it to happen, and then she can adjust to that, she can adjust to that world. So anyway, that's the idea of perceptual adaptation. If you look at your notes now, um, we were ending with um, this topic of um, ESP, and I put up what um, the last, kind of just some definitions of it. 
Uh, let's see real quick. I think this, is this about where we ended? Okay, good. So, real quickly, I'm gonna make this point, um, and that is, psychologists have a lot of skepticism, and scientists, as they begin to study uh, a lot of uh, these areas, um, the field, if you want, the study of something unusual phenomenon is called parapsychology, which means, which means it's outside the discipline. It's outside of or alongside psychology. And if you want the definitions which I had previously um, up here, what I'd like to do is, I mentioned my twin brothers who one of them had his knee hurt and the other one sensed it. What would that fall into? Which category? That one is kind of, it's, it's a little bit of maybe this perception of a distant event. Um, how many are following the, the mine disaster that's going on and, and these 33 miners, they've been in there now and they're getting removed? How many have not even heard about it? <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting. Well, anyway, in Chile, what happened was these miners about three months ago, there was a cave in and 33 miners were lost. And for an entire three weeks, two and a half weeks, there was no communication whatsoever with these miners. And then they sent off probes to try and find, is it possible to find where they're at? And um, by the way, what the Chilean government has now done is they've drilled a hole down there, found them, and they're pulling them out after two and a half months underground. You wanna just take this? Uh, sure. And uh, he's gonna see if he can fix this microphone. So, uh, should I just yell out or you wanna just try that? Um, well, anyway, what they did, I'll just yell out initially. <laughs> what they did was the Chilean government, um, actually, I don't know if you know this, but within the first couple of uh, days after the cave-in, they thought all hope was lost. I mean, these were thousands of feet underground. They could not find them. And so what they ended up, what they ended up doing, <laughs> I'm gonna give this to you. What they ended up doing was this. Um, they, they actually, you don't know, they hired four psychics to say, could you help us find these mines? I mean, you do, I mean, I, I, in a sense, when you're that desperate, you do almost anything to find these people. They were buried underground, no contact, the odds of them. And by the way, all four psychics that were using uh, ESP all said the same thing. What'd they say? Stop searching because they're dead you'll never find them. Now, does that tell us about how good this psychic is? <laughs> we have even some biblical examples, right? When someone makes a prediction, we have a test that says what? If it doesn't work or if, they don't, if they're not accurate, then obviously they're not a prophet. <laughs> well, there are some odd and amazing things when it comes to parapsychology and the study of these things, but I've already told you the bottom line. Most scientists and psychologists are skeptical about the likelihood of this occurring simply because there's very little evidence. In almost all studies, when we begin to look at are there, is there any evidence of one of these three things occurring, telepathy or clairvoyance or precognition, we just don't find reproducible phenomena. But I'm gonna show you today I've already told you one about some with clairvoyance, and then in a minute we're going to show another one. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to send me numbers, and I'm going to see if I can pick them up. So we're going to start very easily. Can you all hear me back there? Here are the numbers. Let's start very easily. Shout it in your mind very loudly, but don't say it or speak it out loud. Send me a number, and I'll see what the majority is. That is being sent to me. But let's go very easily. Ready? Send me in your mind a number between one and four. Loudly. Okay, I was picking up a, a three a lot. Oh, yeah, that was easy. Some of you just didn't shout loud enough in your mind. So let's try it again. Ready? Let's try this one. Um, okay, that was a three. Try, okay, ready? Um, let's try and make it bigger. Between one and ten, send me a number, loudly. Seven. 
All right. Yeah, that, that's what we call, yeah. All right, well, we'll change then. Thank you for sharing. Let's do this to yourself quietly so you don't ruin Dr. Grace's only good examples. Ready, here we go. One in 50, but do it this way. Let's make sure that, um, send me, uh, there'll be the digits will be between one and 50, but send me a number that has two odd digits. That, that makes sense, but not the same one. So you can send me 15, because they're both odd, but don't send 11 because they're the same digit. Does that make sense? Two digits between, or, or, I'm, I'm sorry, number between one and 50, don't send something, there, make sure both digits are odd, okay? 15 works, but not 11, because it's the same. Ready? Send it quietly to me. Okay, I, I'm picking up 37 a lot, <laughs> with a little bit of 35 for just one minute. How many had 37, by the way? Let me see your hands. Or 35, I was picking that up. Okay. Do we have any help or luck or anything? Okay. It just keeps cutting in and out. Okay. All right, now. By using ESP, we fix this thing. All right, here we go. Um, there, there are way better demonstrations of that than I can give you, but, I'm, but I, just to show you what, some of the ways we'll do this, let's try another one, precognition. This one will be really cool. Um, I don't know who will catch this, but someone catch it on that side of the room. <gasps> oh, sweet. All right, throw it back to me. So you, you, you all right. And uh, we'll try this side of the room. Oh, all right. And then we'll tr try, so tell me your name. Logan, who caught it over here? Trevor. Trevor. All right, and then one more. <laughs> Somebody's waving over there. Okay, I'll try it way back this way. I'll just, hmm. Ha. Huh. Did it, no one caught it? Who caught it? Where is it at? Okay, tell me your name. Alan. Okay. So, Alan. Did you say Alan? Alan. I think I have it. Okay, uh, where's Logan? He's the first one. Could you just hand that back to Logan? And Trevor, right? Trevor. Here's what I've done. I have, um, it seems to be working a lot, Joe, thanks. Is it E-L, how do you spell it? E-L-L-Y-N. E-L-L-Y-N, Ellen, huh, all right. <laughs> Ellen, here's what I've done. Uh, it's cutting out, did you know, could you tell? Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> here's what I've done. Uh, I, um, I put a, a word in an article, in a newspaper article, that I'm gonna have you come on up and pick this word out of this article, okay? So I want you to pick a word, you're gonna come up and pick a word out of the top line. But before you do, just so that top line is different, uh, Trevor, Where's Trevor? Trevor, I'm gonna go like this, up and down, right? Where are you at, Trevor? And then you're going to tell me cut so that we have a different top line, does that make sense? Okay, Trevor, I'm gonna start now. I'm gonna go real slow like this, up and down. Tell me when to cut. 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 <laughs> Thank you. All right, Alan, you come on up. What am I saying, Alan? E-L-L-Y? What's your last name? <laughs> Miss, what is it? <laughs> All right, come on up. <laughs> Whatever your name is. E-L-L-Y-N? Alan, what am I? I have a funny accent. <laughs> All right, here's what I want you to do. There, there's a word in, in the top line to pick out because we've adjusted it, but so find a word. Tell me if, the, if I cut through the top line. Did I cut through the top line or can you read it? Mm -hmm. All right, don't pick a little word like the or that or something, okay? Okay. Got a big word? All right, what is it? Tell you. Uh-huh. Questionnaire. Uh, one more time. Questionnaire. Questionnaire. Okay, thanks. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you're good. No, you're awesome. 
All right, she picked a word out of the top line questionnaire. <sighs> Logan, do you have the envelope? Open it up real quick. <laughs> Logan, can you tell me what word is written on there and then hold it up? What's the word? <laughs> can you hold it? Question A. See, I, I may not be able to pronounce her word, or her name, but I know the word she's going to pick. Ooh. That really is an example of precognition, perception of future events. All right. One more time. Ready? Let's try one more. Who needs it? How about an example of clairvoyance? I'm going to turn it down one notch. What do you think? I'll do it from here. Let's try, let's try clairvoyance. There is somebody who believes that they can see into the future, um, mostly by looking into remote events, not necessarily the future, but like staying in this room. And this person is in a different building right now. And so here's what we're gonna do. I need two people, <laughs> two, just two real quick volunteers. And you're, it's, not a, it's not, oh, why don't you do two get in the same row? All right, you guys. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna basically leave the room so you don't know what we're doing in here. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a playing card, okay? And you guys, are, what I want you to do is not be able to hear. So go at least down the hallway so you can't hear what we're going to do. At which point, we'll come get you in about, it'll only take us about one or two minutes, okay? One or two minutes. Somebody? Mm. Nice. Oh, come on up. Yeah. This is a, just a normal deck of playing cards, and here's what this clairvoyant is going to do. They're going to be able to see this playing card. So you get to go find anybody in this classroom, and you guys decide either you can let, let them randomly pick a single card, you know, or you guys can decide on a card. Go, go find somebody. Pick out any card that you guys want, however you want to do it. <laughs> pick me, pick me. Okay, now, now uh, we're going to all look at that card together, so r nice and quietly. I think so. What do you think? Is it cutting out? Is it working? The microphone's working. Joe, thanks. Do Joe is... Yeah. Okay. That's your card? Okay, ready? Settle down. Not really. This is their card. Ready? I'm going to say it real quietly. Can you go make sure they can't hear me? Because I'm going to say it. Okay. Right there. Ready? It's the eight of clubs. You get it back there? Eight of clubs. Okay, could you go get them? <laughs> All right. Okay, here's what I'd like you guys to do. We, while you, you, while you were away, we as a class or whatever picked a, a playing card. Do you have any idea what that card is? Six of hearts. Six of hearts. No. Um, <laughs> it's not, that was a good guess though. But Colleen, as clairvoyant Colleen, they call her, knows what the card is. Here's what I need you to do. She's at this extension. You're going to call and ask for Colleen and ask her, did she see the card? Does that make sense? Since you guys don't know, you're gonna call Colleen and you're going to ask her, Colleen, do you know what that card is? And since you don't know it, you can't give it to her. Does that make sense? Yeah. And she's gonna tell you what the card is. So come here, call 5308. <laughs> Hold on, dial 5308. Ask if Colleen is there and if she saw a card. Colleen, where'd that card go? <laughs> Hold on. Hi. Ask her. Did you see the card? <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, I do. 
What did she say? Okay, okay, tell her thank you. No questions for you about who her. <laughs> Are you still there? Tell her thank you. What did she say? Eight of clubs. Okay, by the way, that was the card we picked. Yeah, it wasn't the six of hearts, but good job. Thanks for playing and, uh, and helping me. Um, okay. Okay, real quickly. Two very important things. I <laughs> am not, I don't have ESPN, and Colleen is not. <laughs> or ESP. Or ESPN. I watch it all the time. That would be a cool stat channel, though. <laughs> yeah, the score of tomorrow's World Series is six to three. <laughs> oh. You have to follow that one. I don't have ESP, nor, nor am I a magician. And, ready, Colleen is not clairvoyant. This is all, there was somebody at the end of the line, they asked, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, it, it's a trick, and here's the difference. In any time there are events like this, some people get fooled because the greater the trick or the bigger the thing is, some people say, that just proves that I'm one, uh, uh, I have one of these um, you know, clairvoyance or telepathy. When in reality, um, a lot of what's occurring in uh, most of these are just simply sleights of hand. And that's the same thing, knowing um, that the word questionnaire would be picked. I could have been wrong. It's a slight that's done. Uh, words or numbers that you can send, there's certain ways of getting those or even seeing this or that card. And so therefore, whenever we put this to the test, magicians can be very helpful for us in determining that which is just a trick. Um, so the magician shared this with, with me, which also means that I'm not going to be able to tell you how I did it. <laughs> I know. I will tell you, uh, that if, you, if you're getting ready to graduate and if you still remember this and you're still like, I've got to know, and you, you can tell me, or you can ask me and I'll tell you how, how about at that point. Does that sound good? If you remember. One person last year did. Dr. Grace, I was in your class four years ago. I'm graduating. You're going to tell me now the answer. Like, wow, you've been worrying about that the whole time? Anyway. Questions? Yeah. Which Colleen? Clairvoyant Colleen, they call her. I don't know which Colleen. It's just a person. Very freaky, isn't it? There are no times, by the way, when somebody who claims to have ESP can reproduce it for us to a satisfaction that shows that they can do one of these things. It rarely, sh and in fact, evidence um, well, let's put it this way. There is a million dollar reward out there for anybody that shows evidence of one of these things. All you have to do is convince a, a panel of skeptics and magicians that you have actually done this and you will win one million. By the way, that award has been offered for the last, it's, it's been moved up every year. 25 years ago, it was 10,000 and then it moved to 100,000. No one has ever yet been able to claim it. Does that tell you something? Yeah, it probably tells you that people have tried. Um, it, 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 there's very little evidence. It's not reproduced in laboratories. It doesn't show up uh, when, when we try and examine it. And we really don't find any evidence for this weird energy that's going on. We can't account for any of these things as some claim that there's a weird, unique energy. It just fails to be detectable. So I'm gonna stop there and move forward unless you have questions at all. Um, and because, I, by the way, I think this is interesting stuff, but I'll tell you what I find personally in all my years of studying all this, something way more interesting. And you know what's for me way more interesting than any of this? This is just stuff um, that people kind of find, you know, intriguing. But I'll tell you what is way more fascinating. Way more fascinating is right now looking at your faces and knowing that you're conscience, conscious. That to me um, may be for some, one of the greatest mysteries we have in psychology. Um, you all are conscious. Most everybody in this room has never ever lost, the abil lost consciousness. When you go to sleep, you don't go unconscious, you just go into a different state of consciousness. To, for you to say you're conscious is very easy. I look at you, you look at me, you're aware of certain things. We all have this kind of a stimuli that are coming in that you know about, I know about. You have internal stimuli you can pay attention to. But when you lose it, we do. So what happens when you lose consciousness here or when you try and define 
what consciousness is, you run into this amazing riddle. There's a guy named Steven Pinker out of Harvard, wrote a book called How the Mind Works. It's this thick. It's very interesting. He's a great writer, great researcher, and he wrote a book, How the Mind Works, and you know what he ends his book with? I'm not sure how the mind works. Basically, I'm not sure how consciousness comes to be. Consciousness, it's not really like they call a mystery wrapped in an enigma surrounded by a riddle, but it's close. Just to say you are is amazing. To try and show what it is or demonstrate evidence of it begins to be what we call very slippery. What does it mean that you're aware of me right now? How, what did, where does this come from? It's, it's hard to explain in many cases. It seems like it's evidence of something. So here's what I want to do. I want to switch, again, unless you have any questions real quick, I want to talk a little bit about what we know about consciousness and awareness and what we're learning. It leads us into topics like variations in awareness, some biological rhythms, um, and, and ultimately into st something called sleep and dreaming, uh, and, and then research related to that. We'll talk briefly on Wednesday about hypnosis as well. You don't have to write this down. <laughs> it's just a quote, real quick, William James. It's meaning we know so long as no one asks us to define it. Consciousness, you're intimately familiar with. When we ask people to define it, or, how, well, let's start with this. How many in this room, how many have ever lost consciousness? And I'm going to tell you, the numbers are going to be small. Let me see your hands that you've lost consciousness. Most of you are going to predict about of the 20, 30 people, how many of you lost consciousness? That is, you've been, quote, knocked unconscious, usually because of head trauma. And let's ignore if you've been put under by a doctor, um, which is also slightly different. Usually losing consciousness requires an, a, a trauma to the head, an accident. Um, how many lost consciousness for longer than, let's say, 10 minutes? We still, oh, we have two people left. Three, four, five, 10 minutes. Anybody longer than an hour? We, ha we have one longer than an hour. Here's what's amazing. And all, it, it, with 500 and some people in this room right now, one lost consciousness for longer than an hour. I've lost it about two or three times, all because of sports injuries. Got hit in the head with a baseball one time. And uh, I was standing there batting like this, and it was in the gym. It was in a Colorado. We were warming up because it was snowing outside. And so I'm warming up like this, and a guy's hitting ground balls, and he hit one very hard to these guys behind me, and in, he didn't hit a ground ball, he hit a line drive right at me. And I'm standing there, next thing I know is I'm out, because this ball just went and hit me. And, uh, and I, I remember this you know, thing on my head, and I woke up going, it was just I, maybe five seconds. That's not uncommon. How many have had that experience? You get hit in the head, five seconds later, you're like, Gew. yeah. One time I was golfing recently, and I had my glasses on like this, and I had um, the uh, lenses on like this, and I'm standing there at this golf tee like this, waiting, Three guy, four guys are standing around, and a guy from the 14th hole hits this ball about 200 yards, and it hooked, and it hit me right in the head. And I didn't know, I'm just standing there, and all of a sudden, kaboom, it hit so hard that my lenses popped out, bing, like that. They just popped out, and this golf ball size not was on my head. And my first thought, he's a faculty member here, I looked at him and said, you idiot, you hit me. <laughs> and he goes, dude, man, I didn't hit you, that ball hit you. And, and I was really struggling for a while with thinking and I felt unclear what was going on. I kept golfing because it was an important game. <laughs> So just like I kept playing baseball that day. But anyway, so I, I, and, but, but about the 17th hole, I'm going, I'm not sure I'm thinking very clearly. And it was a long way away, and I'm now driving home. And I call my wife, and I say, you know what, I'm, I, something happened to me today. I got hit in the head. And, and she goes, well, you're driving? She goes, and I said, yeah. She goes, I'm going away this weekend, and you're going to be home with the kids. Are you all right? I went, yeah, I'm fine. W what were we talking about again? No. <laughs> So I get home, and the whole, but here's the weirdest thing. I couldn't see very clearly. And that was the biggest concern. I was like, I can't see. I'm, things are like a little bit more blurry than normal. Not weird, but, and so the next day or two, Lisa says, Chris, go into the doctor. And I said, no, I'm fine, really. The second day, Chris, you really normally a little bit, hmm, but now you're like a lot more, hmm, okay? And so, so I go, 
and she goes, and I, by the way, I'm going away. I'm going to set an appointment for you. I said, at least I'm fine. The third day, she, no, uh, uh. So she sets an MRI. I go in, and the guy goes, hey, good news. You had a con good news, bad news. You had a concussion, but there's no blood on the, on the inside on the brain, and you're fine. And I said, but that's the weird thing. I said, my vision could it have been hit there? affected my vision. He goes, no, that's weird. I don't really know that. And I said, well, that's really why I'm here, because I was worried about that. And he says, I don't think, I don't think that was it. That's, I, that usually wouldn't happen. <laughs> so I decided to go right from there over to Lens Crafters. And I walk in, I said, yeah, I got hit in the head, and my glasses, the lenses popped out. She goes, yeah, you put your lenses in backwards. <laughs> So she fixed them and I put them on and went, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I did not need an MRI, I'm fine. My thinking cleared up everything. True story. And my wife is back there, she can verify. Okay. You got hit, oh, we have one person for longer than an hour. Uh, I was in fourth grade. In fourth grade? Had a concussion. He, he said what happened was, he ran, if you didn't hear, he was in fourth grade, ran into a girl, <laughs> which can actually be a little bit destabilizing at times. And you go that, especially for fourth graders, huh? So he runs into this girl, gets knocked, you get knocked out, and then, yeah, obviously had a concussion. By the way, that is one of the side effects, is not really knowing some of the things that are occurring or just occurred, yeah? Uh, when, uh, yeah, that's not good. And all these things you're describing, forgetfulness, going to bed, even sleeping for a long time, and then not, not remembering, yeah, uh, yeah. When you get, like, hurt, do you, like, not feel the pain for a while? Because, like, um, when I was in cheerleading, I blacked out Yeah, it's not uncommon. She's, she's describing getting knocked out one time in cheer. She said a, a cheerleader landing on her head again. I'm not sure, we, you, you get hit by, yeah, okay, so let's leave that one alone, but as you're sitting there and she falls, you get knocked out, not feeling a lot of pain, she says, and what's that like? Well, the answer is, there are ways in which when trauma occurs to our body, we'll talk a little bit, we talked about this, the flooding of en endorphins, remember that body's natural painkiller, which is usually the response during accidents, and which is why you don't maybe feel things right away. By the way, this is an example, this person, how many remember Terry Schiavo, the story? Most, some of you do. Um, Terry Schiavo, you don't have to write this down. She was the one who uh, fell into a state of a um, cardiac arrest in 1990. Her brain was deprived, again, don't have to write this down. Her brain was deprived of oxygen. She went into what's called a persistent vegetative state. She never came out of that vegetative state. For the next eight years, her husband stayed uh, obviously by her and whatever, but and finally in 88 he said, my wife is no longer here. She's been eight years in this state. Let's remove all of things that are keeping her alive. And um, because she, she's gone from that day, for, you know, from that moment, she hasn't been here. So eight years later, he tried to end his wife's life support. Then all kinds of things started happening. At that point, if you remember this, in 01, they did remove the tube, but two days later, they put it in. In 03, they removed it again. Five days later, Jeb Bush, the governor at the time of Florida, had it successfully restored. It became known as Terry's Law. In 04, the Florida Supreme Court struck down Terry's Law. In 05, President Bush signed the bill to save Terry. In 05, they said that it should not be reinserted. On, that was starting the 22nd of March. And then on the 31st of March, 2005, Terry dies. You see, what consciousness is, is something that we all hold and we keep and we rarely lose. And when we do, we are almost always at 
unaware of now what does that mean for that person. There are many signs and evidences that we now have that people who are in a vegetative state may just simply be able, unable to communicate. That maybe they're truly there, and that's what people are thinking. She's there, she just can't get out or talk. And there are some cases like that. There are other cases in which it is very clear that the person no longer is there or functioning. In Terry's case, the family tried to argue, her mom and, and father tried to argue that Terry was there. Her husband said, no, nah, she's not. And that's why this went back and forth. By the way, at the autopsy, when uh, they determined that her brain had sufficient damage um, from the earlier cardiac arrest, losing of oxygen, that such that what the parents thought that she was able to see, um, there was such damage to the visual cortex area that she probably never was able to see and probably had very limited awareness, if at all, given the extent of the damage. Now, this leads us to the definitions. What does, what does it mean to be conscious? It means, well, she has to be aware of something. She's got to have the external internal stimuli that, that is present for her or for any of us to pick up. And so the way we define it is this selective attention to ongoing perceptions or ongoing stimuli or thought, like thoughts and feelings. Um, by the way, there is no, th th these things are very difficult to determine uh, when somebody ultimately loses this, but when they do, we call that a persistent vegetative state, which um, I'll define and show you some examples uh, in just a minute. But aware consciousness itself is just simply this awareness of internal and external stimuli. Question, go ahead. Um, he asked this question, when do Christians believe that the soul leaves the body? I, I, I'll tell you this, I think Christians would probably cite what we, um, in, 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 most, you know, in most countries, though not all, most would say, uh, and I think we would probably agree with this, that the soul s s seems to have, mm, when there's no brain, Electri electrical waves going, when there's no brain activity whatsoever, our culture and our medical doctors and ethicists say that's when death has just occurred, when there's no brain functioning. And so if you hook Terry Schiavo up, you would find some rudimentary activity of the brain. That's why she was in this persistent vegetative state. But death is when, there's, when you flatline. There's no, no, no uh, electrical activity whatsoever. That's when we call it, that's when it happens. I'm, to be honest, I don't know the answer, you know, as a theologian, what they would say, but I would assume that we would assume that, uh, that they would say that the, at that point also would be the same sign that the soul is no longer there. Tough question though. Um, yeah. The soul, by the way, his question, when does it leave? If you want to know what, what a soul is, what, Christians would identify as a soul is just simply that when you say me or my or mine, that invisible, let's say immaterial, um, conscious me would be how we would define a soul. Um, the soul, as he asked, how do we know when it leaves? It's when the, we know evidence that the soul exists because it has faculties, right? The soul has perceptual abilities. You, we've been talking about perception, so you can sense or know things or organize and interpret your world. But it also has, the, the soul's faculties would involve the will, um, the ability to say, I want to do something, or emotions, you feeling certain emotional uh, experiences or having beliefs or thoughts which compose your mind, and then how you relate to God, your spirit. All of these, I think, we could call and identify as the soul. I, I, we could spend a lot more time on this, but I'm not going to, other than to say that when this leaves, again, maybe when we find these faculties no longer functioning, including organs and especially the brain, because when the brain stops functioning, almost all of these, of course, would cease. Yeah, question. What what would have been some biblical guidelines to help guide Terry's husband in deciding whether or not to remove the life support? Yeah, I'm just saying, 
I think the answer is this is a murky, difficult area. Some evidence, but please hear me, very little evidence that people in long-term vegetative states ever wake up. A good buddy of mine uh, runs this uh, the head trauma unit at University of Rochester. He was a faculty member here for a while. Runs the, he the head trauma unit at Rochester. He tends to get in those that have come out of or are coming out of some states uh, like that and he tries to help them reorient. But he oftentimes has been thinking about this and it's, I'll just say this, there is no real clear guidelines because people um, can be in states and there are rare occasions when somebody has woken up 10, 12 years later, it just happened. A guy, maybe about two years ago, was in a state for about 11 years, had a moment of lucidity. That is, he just kind of came to. Brought his, his son was there, who is now 11 years old. He had a conversation that lasted about three days. His lucidity, that is his awareness, his knowledge of this, that he's now, something happened and he's awake and talking about it, and it began to slowly fade that ability to know and after about the third or fourth day you could tell he was regressing and he's now kind of in this what we call an in-between state not not fully conscious but not back in the vegetative state so it does happen it's rare the belief is with her it probably would not have happened but that's all to say it's hard to know yeah you had a question one more time uh, fainting is a little bit different. You don't go unconscious. Fainting is, is you know, different w reasons why you faint, of course. Um, we'll talk some about that when, it, when we talk some about sleeping disorders that involve someone falling into this state, you know, like a fainting. It's just a kind of a different level of awareness, a different level of consciousness. It's not losing consciousness, though. And uh, we'll talk about it. It's oftentimes the blood, uh, the brain not getting enough blood. By the way, just, um, just real quickly, People have been struggling and asking the question a long time. Steven Pinker was not the first one who asked the question, how does the brain work? What is consciousness? Um, years and years ago, I wrote an article uh, with a philosopher here. We co-wrote an article, a guy named J.P. Moreland, and our article was looking at this very thing. Where does self, how do you explain self-awareness? How do you explain self-consciousness? Um, in light of some of what evolutionary theorists were doing and in light of what some ideas that were called intelligent design that God made us, can that help us better explain consciousness and awareness? And so, uh, but we're just one article in thousands that have been attempted or written on this topic hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and for probably thousands of years, people have asked this question. James, Freud, all of them talked about things like streams of consciousness. William James said that our consciousness kind of flows in streams throughout the day. Sometimes we're here, sometimes we're there. Sometimes you, in this class, will go through variations in consciousness in a stream. Freud talked about the, that unconscious is like a river that moves that river around. You don't really see the, that current of unconscious, but it definitely shapes what you're thinking. And so there have been different theories out there about it. We're gonna kinda switch to some other things related to controlled processes, but yeah. What's the title of that article? I don't know, I'll get it for you. He asked the title of the article, I, I, I'll have to remember. I know, it's, something, it's been so long, five years, I'll, I don't remember. I'll, I'll get it for you. Um, controlled processes. Um, Right now, you are hopefully in a controlled process. That is, you are alert and awake. <laughs> Most of you are alert and awake. And, but at the highest level, when do you find yourself most alert and awake? What might you be doing that demands high concentration? Give me some things that might demand it. So, playing a, a game, uh, taking a test. Maybe when there's, well, okay. Playing a video game, taking an exam, how about if we do that? Sometimes when you're learning how to drive uh, initially, you might have this high concentration. This is called a controlled process. It, it, it's just simply uh, kind of contrasted with something called an automatic process, which is something that you could be doing that doesn't demand a whole lot of attention or awareness. We would call that this automatic process. It's kind of like when you're on autopilot. Some of you recognize when you're on autopilot, you're just kind of daydreaming, maybe not really fully there. Um, 
some of you now, how many can drive a stick shift and you don't even think about it? You drive, but when you first learned, how many of y'all were dangerous as you were learning to drive? And so you did it in like a parking lot or something because you have to have a lot of concentration um, to, to learn clutches and moving, you know, the gears and all of that, of which today you can just probably eat and drive and talk on the cell phone at the same time. Mm -hmm. This, by the way, daydreaming would be a function of being on autopilot. Yeah, go ahead, question. What happens during an out-of-body experience? Um, well, there's lots of theories and ideas about what happens with an, uh, with an out-of-body experience. I'll tell you what, at the end of chapter seven, there's some, some material there. Um, let's see how much we get through, and I might, we might get to that. But if, if I don't, certainly at the end of the book, they talk a little bit about it. Um, is there, it, what is it and how it happens? That's a great question. By the way, whenever we look at uh, dream, uh, like daydreams, we look at, um, it, it's identified by reduced eye movement, and if we had you hooked up, if we had you hooked up to a brain um, EEG electroencephalogram, we'd see something called this high level of alpha activity, and I'll explain what that means in just a minute. Okay, questions? Remember, you don't wake up in the morning and just simply now you're conscious and stay in that same state. You go into some different states throughout the day. Daydreaming cycles throughout the day. About every, ready? About every 90 minutes, you're more prone to daydream on a cycle. What does that mean? I'll show you in just a second. By the way, there are different states of consciousness that we, um, we really won't spend that much time. We did talk a little bit about these altered states, which are just shifts in our perceptions, shifts in our awareness, in our memory, our time. These would be examples like sleep, uh, which has a weird shift in it, drugs, uh, fatigue, delirium, sensory overload, hypnosis, brain injury. Um, altered states, we'll talk a lot about uh, sleep. We've already talked some about drugs and I'll share a little bit about what that means when we call altered state, but these are just distinct shifts in this awareness. And the shifts mean that our emotions, our perceptions, the sense of how we feel about time, uh, or even our thinking becomes a little bit odd or strange, which you can relate to, of course, when you've been woken up. It's like, where am I? What happened? What, is that a dream? Is this real? Whatever, all of these kinds of altered states, and so we'll spend some time talking about them. Did, was there a question, though, someone? No? Okay. Um, let me just real quickly go these, through these variations. Everybody ready to move forward? <laughs> okay. Anything up here not make sense? I think it is all there or anything. Yeah, go ahead. We'll talk about hypnosis, and the answer is yes, people that are hypnotized do have different, can experience these shifts. Um, and in fact, I'll show you a little videotape that has someone who's hypnotized and what's, what some of those effects are. Yeah. Okay, real quickly then, because I'm not going to define these, these are just examples. You don't even have to write them down, but they're just simple examples of some what we call altered states whether it's brain injury or hypnosis. This you for sure don't have to write down. I just want to identify the words that we've been using, like a coma. Anybody here know somebody that's been in a coma that's gotten out of the coma? That is where you have some sort of trauma to the brain. You can go into what's called unconscious. You see that line there. That line separates people out from awake or consciousness to asleep, and then this coma, some people wake up, of course people, this is what you asked about before, brain death can occur, um, people can get into a locked in state or minimally conscious. The guy that woke up after 11 years, saw his son, talked to him for three days, is now in what we call a minimally conscious state. He's there, uh, but it feels like he's kind of in between awareness. He's in between consciousness and unconsciousness. And then, of course, we've been talking about the vegetative states, which some people can stay in a long time. Where are we when you're like half awake and half asleep? Yeah, half awake and half asleep, you're fully above the line in consciousness. You're just in what's called an altered state. But you, are, you don't go below that line in your life, usually ever, unless you get hit. So when you wake up in a weird kind of, you feel strange and you're not sure what's happening, you're still conscious. By the way, Terry Schiavo, um, 
was, again, just evidence of staying in that vegetative state. Now, let me share real quickly these biological clocks that we go through. Yeah? Um, I have a question. Uh, we were talking about the soul earlier. Yes. Um, I have a friend with a, a mentally challenged brother, like, and, like, some of the things that you describe with a soul, yeah. he doesn't. Yeah, his question is this. He has a, a friend who has a brother, and this brother has some developmental uh, delays and some, right, is that what you called it? Uh, something like maybe, um, well, I don't know. Down syndrome. Okay, he's, yeah, Down syndrome. Uh -huh. Severely mild case of Down syndrome. Yeah, Down syndrome um, uh, shows evidence that their brain isn't, you know, the same set up, for example, and so there's definite limits about their abilities. No doubt, though, their brains are intact. They have everything else there. They're just limited. I, my, my niece is Down syndrome, and so there's a lot there, but it wouldn't change necessarily her experiences of the world. They would just be, let's say, slightly developmentally dis delayed. Um, that's how they would look at this kind of thing. So the soul would be there. It's just that the brain doesn't function in many of the same ways that, let's say, a normal uh, person's brain would. Uh, how would yeah. I guess we talked about with my friend before. Like, how would someone with that doesn't have the capabilities of like the things that we do? How would they accept like Christ in their life? Yeah, this question. Uh, it's a good question. How would somebody with some of these dis developmentally dis uh, disorders? or brain disorders, how does that affect, let's say, even some of their ability to make decisions? Or, and, and, and of course, um, many of them would, would uh, still require someone to stay or live with them because some of their decisions would not be, let's say, in their best interest or they may not know how to make them. And so the question is, could they, for example, know that there's a God that cares and loves for them and, and make decisions? And we'd have to trust you know, what God has done with individuals throughout history and how it, he, he shows compassion on those and especially those that are children. And um, so my guess is that's how, you know, there's a sense in which he, he, he probably finds that uh, as a child coming unto him uh, who may not fully know everything, but trusts in him, let's say, with a faith that we may not know. Good questions. Um, by the way, these internal chemical mechanisms that are found in the thalamus and the hypothalamus, one area that these clocks, by the way, we're talking about a biological chemical clocks that actually go, one of them is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I don't know if any of y'all have heard of this one before. This is kind of like the master clock in our heads. They've taken rats and uh, have found uh, this location in their brains where this very, what we call master clock exists. And for rats that don't have that uh, master clock, their worlds, uh, just like any humans, would be completely randomized. Those miners that are down in that cave without any light or dark for months probably started to alter some of their timing things. For example, if we put you in a cave and didn't tell you what time it was, you couldn't know, and you didn't know the lights and the, everything else, what time, if, if you normally went to bed at midnight, what would happen is you would cycle on with one of these clocks on a 24-hour cycle. So for all of us, our cycles get adjusted with light and everything else, and you get tired again at midnight, let's say. And then the next night around midnight, because your body's adjusting to, these, to the light. And it, but somebody who you remove all of these external things from, you put them in a cave, they do something weird. Anybody know what happens to their cycle? Almost every one of us in here would follow what's called about a 24 and a half to close to a 25 hour cycle. So if you didn't know what time it was and light didn't help you out, you would start to go to bed the first night at midnight, the next night around a little before one o'clock, and the next night, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. So after about 10 to 15 days, you'd be going to bed at around you know, two, or, you know, 10, 11 in the morning, feeling like that was night because we cycle on this 24 and a half, almost 25 hour cycle, but light helps us kind of keep it in gear uh, and in line with the 24-hour cycle. And that's this function of this suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's the major clock in our brain that tells us when things go off. And be like this, light helps adjust it. Does that make sense? Without light, without the light shining, literally, light we can take in through our eyes affects this clock and kind of, in a sense, synchronizes it with our world. Yeah, question. 
Yeah, it has a lot to do, there's, there's, it's much more complex than that. There are certain uh, chemicals, hormones, melatonin, you heard of, uh, 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 different ways in which this would send out, this clock would function. Um, let me just give you some examples. One would be an infradian cycle that would do this. Female menstrual cycles occur, thankfully, less than frequently than once a day. <laughs> no, that was just for you. I wasn't being mean or anything. Just saying that they occur less frequently, but things like tooth pain or symptoms of depression, um, some of these are what we call infradian. The word dian is day. Infra means less, uh, less frequently than once a day. So, a cycle that takes 28 days. Or sometimes for depression, you might find what's called seasonal affective disorder that only occurs in the winter months. Those would be what we call infradian cycles or rhythms. Um, those are just examples. How about circadian? That means it circles in about a day. That would be about every 24 hours. Circa in a day, circle a day, circadians. Sleep wake, body temperature. Um, your body temperature alters and goes back and forth like that. That's why jet lag can be so, uh, how many have experienced jet lag before? Jet lag is this internal desynchronization because the suprachiasmatic nucleus and all the other symptoms are seeing the, the daylight out there. You've traveled, it's now for you midnight, but in the city or country you are in, um, it's now, let's say, during the day, and your body's what we call in, in, in desynchronization, and that's the experience of jet lag. Okay, those happen every 24 hours. And then, lastly, there are circadian rhythms, I mean, sorry, biological rhythms. that have, Give me some examples of those that happen more frequently than once a day. Like they happen hourly. We know some examples? What's that? Yeah, hunger pain, stomach contractions. Many occur oftentimes 90 minutes a day. Anybody know any other ones? Here's one, ready? Your nose. You breathe in and out of it, out of only one nostril at a time. So watch, breathe out, put your fingers up here and breathe out. And you can tell you're only breathing out of one nostril. How many are breathing out of the right nostril right now? Only. How many are breathing out of the left? Check your nose again later today and it rotates and shifts and that's on a, a cycle. Did you guys not know that? Yeah. Now I'll see you guys walking around campus later today going like this all the time. It switched. <laughs> These are all trade-in. Stomach contractions, he said. Alertness, I mentioned. Oh, daydreams. Big ones that occur on ultra, on ultra every 90 minutes. What's the most famous one that we know a lot about? Every 90 minutes, approximately, this circadian goes off and we see very clear evidence of it during a something that you do. Yeah, it's during sleep. During sleep, if we watch you, what do you, what will we sign, what will we see on the, if somebody, if you went to sleep and you said your roommate, to your roommate, watch what happens when I sleep, they won't see anything very interesting, except 90 minutes later, what will they see happening? Yeah, they'll begin to see changes in you that have occurred, and they will occur every 90 minutes, because you will have completed an Otradian cycle during sleep. Sleep is one of these weird, um, amazing, weird states. So, I'll leave it here. Most famous is during sleep. Here's what I need you to do. Look at sleep. I'll share a little bit about sleeping and dreamings and briefly hypnosis. We'll do that on Monday. Are there any last questions? If you wanted to sign up for the Friday night thing, just be out in the foyer and there's um, things out there. Okay. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.